I shared this morning with, with the Sunday school class that I had the privilege of teaching that there's a story about a pastor who uh, always knew if he put a cough drop in his mouth, by the time it dissolved, it would be about 20 minutes. <laughs> well, one Sunday, as I am about to do, he put in a cough drop, and he began to preach, and soon it was an hour, and pretty soon it was an hour and a half, and he knew something was wrong because half the audience had left. It wasn't until he got home that he realized he put a button in his mouth. <laughs> so bear with me, as you know, ever since I came back from Lebanon, I've had this uh, condition in my throat. And I've had two doctors' opinions, and I'm going back again tomorrow for another one. But I know it's getting a little bit better. I'm coughing less at night but my voice is still a little raspy. And Dave, when I knew that you would be here, and I had the privilege of pinch hitting for you twice during Holy Week, about three years ago, I thought, oh, great, he could preach. Are you ready? <laughs> Thank God you're always ready. As you know, this year marks the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformers were men and women shaped by a book. They looked at the book, they studied the book, they memorized the book, and their rediscoveries of essential Christian truths in the book changed the course of history. Pastor Jake preached last week on the first of the five solas of the Reformation, sola scriptura, only scripture, scripture alone. The Bible is the book that sparked the Reformation. So when the Reformers used the words sola scriptura, they were expressing their concern for the Bible's authority. And what they meant is that the Bible alone is our ultimate authority. Not the Pope, not the church, not the traditions of the church or church councils, still less personal or subjective feelings. Other sources of authority may have an important role to play, of course, some are established by God, such as the authority of church elders, the authority of the state, the authority of parents over children. But Scripture alone is truly ultimate. Therefore, if any of these other authorities depart from Bible teaching, they are to be judged by the Bible and rejected. Roused to action by the corruption and abuses they saw in the Roman Catholic Church of the time, the visionary pastors and leaders like Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox spearheaded a movement that transformed Christianity and eventually led to the emergence of the Protestant Reformation denominations we have today. The Reformers were guided by the conviction that the church of their day had drifted away from the essential, from the original teachings of Christianity, especially in regard to what it was teaching about salvation. How people can be forgiven of sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and receive eternal life from God. The Reformation movement sought to reorient Christianity on the original message of Jesus and the early church. The five solas are the five Latin phrases or slogans that emerged during the Reformation to summarize the Reformers' theological convictions about the essentials of Christianity. The five solas are sola scriptura, 
Scripture alone, the Bible alone is our highest authority. Sola gratia, grace alone. We are saved by the grace of God alone. Sola fide, faith alone. We are saved through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Solus Christus, Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone is our Lord, Savior, and King. And soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. We live, as Michael reminded us in the children's lesson, all of our life is to be for God's glory. The reformers stood upon the word of God. Before his opponents, Luther cried out 500 years ago, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God, help me, he said, amen, at the Diet of Worms. As believers here at the Covenant Presbyterian Church, we stand with the Reformers upon God's word. Amen? amen. It's okay to say amen. Amen? amen. That's better. Today's sermon is on sola gratia. Grace alone. What does it mean? The words sola gratia mean that human beings have no claim upon God. That is, God owes us nothing except just punishment for our many and very willful sins. Therefore, when he saves sinners, it is totally because it pleases him to do it. He takes the initiative. He loves us first. There is nothing you and I can do to earn God's love. Grace alone is a gift from God and was at the very foundation of the Reformation movement. Indeed, apart from God's grace and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that flows from it, no one would be saved since in our lost condition, Human beings are not capable of winning, seeking out, or even cooperating with God's grace. By insisting on grace alone, the reformers were denying that human methods, human techniques, or strategies in themselves could ever bring anyone to faith. It is grace that brings us to Christ, releasing us from our bondage to sin and raising us from death to spiritual life, which brings us to our text for today, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. Yes, I'm going to have you stand if you would, please, if you're able. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And if you can read that, let us all say it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You may be seated. If you need a title for the sermon, it would be The Amazing Power of Grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for taking the initiative to love us and for sending your Son into the world so that we could really understand who you are and what you continue to do for us. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to convict us of sin and appoint us to your son and his sacrifice on the cross for us. We pray that that same Holy Spirit would now anoint this sermon 
to make it crystal clear just how much we owe you for the gift of your grace to rescue us, to forgive us, and to empower us for life in the here and now and for the glorious promise of eternal life with you forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Messiah, the King of Kings. Amen. A monologue has been floating around in cyberspace for the last 15 years or so, sometimes credited to George Carlin, sometimes to a Columbine high school student, and sometimes to the Dalai Lama. According to Snopes.com, however, it turns out that it originated with an article published by Dr. Bob Moorhead, a retired pastor in Seattle, entitled The Paradox of Our Time. And it goes like this. We have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. Wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences, yet less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. We have more gadgets, but less satisfaction. More medicine, yet less wellness. We take more vitamins, but we see fewer results. We drink too much, we smoke too much, we spend too recklessly, we laugh too little, we drive too fast, get angry quickly. We stay up late, get up too tired, read too seldom, watch too much TV, and almost never pray. We have multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We fly in faster planes to arrive there quicker to do less and return sooner. We sign more contracts only to realize fewer profits. We talk too much. We love too seldom. We lie too often. We've learned how to make a living but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. Dr. Moorhead's comments have struck a chord, especially with internet readers. He diagnoses a low-grade discontent, a, a sense that for all their wonder, science and technology have not slacked human thirst. The accumulation of material go goods is at an all-time high, but not so in the number of people who feel an emptiness in their lives. According to a recent Gallup poll, 73% of Americans say moral values are worsening, while only 14% judge them improving. There is a malaise, a sense of insecurity, even fear about the future, let alone all the violence and the tragedies of the last couple of months. There are times when one wonders if anybody really cares about the direction our Western society is heading. And in the midst of this, there is a thirst for honesty, for real news, a hunger for truth, for something that is just and real. One of the best books I read over the last 20 years is Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace? It got me through the crisis of losing a wife to breast cancer. It brought comfort when I lost my oldest son who took his life when he was 34. I must have bought 10 copies of the book to give away to friends 
going through some particular crisis. When Yancey wrote the book, his title was What's So Amazing About Grace? And then he added the foot, the subtitle was Why Don't Christians Show More of It? But the publisher persuaded him to drop those last eight words from the title. However, that question has only grown more urgent in recent years. Why doesn't the church show more of it? Like a sudden thaw in the middle of winter, grace happens at unexpected moments. It stops us short, it catches our breath, it disarms. If we manipulate it or try to control it or think somehow we can earn it, we discover that that would not be grace. Yet not everyone has tasted of that amazing grace and not everyone believes in it. We live in a time of division and discord. Grace seems to be in vanishing supply. Why? And what can we do about it? That's what I want to preach about today. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament to chapter 2. I want to read the first 10 verses. You don't need to stand for it this time. You did it wonderfully earlier. I'm going to read it from the message. You'll find the words are considerably different. They're very poignant, and I hope you will hear it as if you're hearing these words for the very first time. Sometimes I think we get so familiar with passages, especially in Ephesians, because it's such an incredible book. And when we read it, we don't really hear it. It doesn't really stick. And so I'm going to read these wonderful ten verses from the message translation. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in the old stagnant life of sin. Paul is reminding the church at Ephesus, which he planted. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love. He embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next, to shower grace and kindness upon us. Saving is all Christ's idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No. We neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, And I love this last phrase, work we better be doing. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Amen. This passage, no matter what translation you read it from, 
is one of the clearest, most expressive, and most loved descriptions of salvation in the New Testament. It contains the first, it contains the first of five explicit formally and now contrasts the before and the after, which distinguishes a life of sin and alienation before in a previous life without Christ from a present life now of faith in Christ. These contrasts constitute one of the main objects in the book of Ephesians. The number of oppositions in this passage is striking. Living in transgressions and sin versus living in good works prepared by God. This world versus the heavenly realms. Death versus life. Sinful nature, literally flesh, versus union with Christ. Wrath versus mercy and by nature versus by grace. Not from works versus through faith. Most of the major themes of Paul's salvation theology are present in these 10 verses. Verses one to three describes his former way of life and sin. He says, it wasn't so long ago you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing. When we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. These verses remind us that when we came into this world, we were dead spiritually. Before Paul became a believer in Jesus the Messiah, before Paul encountered Jesus, his name then was Saul, before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and experienced his powerful conversion, he was a, Jew, a Jesus hater out to destroy the church. He was arresting and rounding up Christians, even participating in the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian faith. And you and, he, you and I need to remember, like Paul remembered, that all of us came into this world spiritually dead. We were without hope. We were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and with God, without God in the world. And I want to make this perfectly clear. We cannot save or regenerate ourselves. We came into the world dead spiritually, not sort of hard of hearing toward the gospel, not simply crippled in good works, not struggling to keep your head above the waters of sin. We were dead. Spiritually lifeless and unmoving. Everything that a dead corpse can contribute to becoming alive, you could do spiritually to believe in Christ, which is to say nothing. Dead means dead. Look at verses four to seven. And here I'm taking it from, from the NIV. But God who is rich in mercy. I love that phrase, but God. But God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I love how the message translates this. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. Then he picked us up and set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. 
But God, because of the wealth of mercy in his being, loving dead corpses such as we are, said to us, live. And as surely as the voice of God raised the Son of God from the tomb outside Jerusalem, he raised us up from death and set us about the works of Christ by the same power that breathed in our souls from the beginning of our first cries of faith. As you all know, Halloween is just around the corner, and then Thanksgiving. And before you know it, it will be Christmas. Isn't one of the greatest truths of Christmas the word of the angel to Mary? Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For with God, nothing will be impossible. How can I have a baby? I have no husband. I'm a virgin. That's right, Mary, you don't. But now learn the most important lesson in the universe. Reckon with the reality of God and who he is. A virgin can't produce a baby, but God can. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. Look at verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the good news of Jesus. No boasting, no claim of contribution to our own resurrection, to our own new life. We boast but say nothing but useless of ourselves. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. Over the past few months, Pastor Jake and I have been talking and praying about the need to have more testimonies of what God is doing in our community and congregation, to remind and encourage us in our faith journey. Approximately two weeks ago, Christina and I attended a banquet celebrating 85 years of specialized ministry to the jails and prisons of Orange County. In the program that followed the meal, one of the testimonies we heard that night was from a young man named Brian Southern, who was a professional baseball player in the minor leagues who lost it all due to drugs and some wrong decisions, who had been in and out of jail, but because of God's grace has come to faith in Christ. He's now clean and works for the Association of Christian Athletes mentoring young men. I've invited Byron today to come up here and tell his story to demonstrate the power, the power of God's grace. Brian, please come forward. And I'm so glad you're here. He was hoping to bring his four-year-old son, but he's not feeling well but I'm glad you are. Thank you, brother. I am very humbled to be here. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to say that the, uh, the brother that plays the five handbells, that's a really serious skill set right there. <laughs> but I think we ought to give him a round of applause. <laughs> um, once again, thank you for having me. It's been about 17 years since I've been here, and uh, I will let you know and fill you in why that is. 
Uh, if we could bow our heads real quick and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day, and I want to thank you for another beautiful day that wasn't promised, Lord. And I just ask that you would pour out your mercy and grace on this congregation, Lord, and that we would just be filled to every fiber of our being, Lord, with your love, that we would just learn more about it each and every day. And I pray, Lord, for the children that were here today. I pray, Lord, that they would be dangerous for your kingdom. I pray that you would keep them safe. You would guard them from evil, Lord. And that you would just foster that relationship with them growing up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I am Brian Southern. And uh, I started struggling uh, right around nine years of age uh, in school, making bad decisions. Um, parents took me to the doctor. They slapped me with the label of ADHD. I didn't really care for that. But I did uh, try the medication and different things. Well, uh, I just so desperately wanted to fit in was really what it came down to. And I was addicted to approval and um, had a real fear, a root of rejection in my life. And uh, that's kind of what stemmed a lot of the troubles. And, uh, so I started uh, seeking attention. However, I could get it good attention, bad attention, it was still attention. Um, I was uh, really just started developing more and more bad habits out of that, more and more character defects, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, um, anger, temper, which led to a lot of shame. Uh, I was kicked out of, uh, my parents tried to get me into some Christian schools. <laughs> Covenant was one of them. I was uh, kicked out in uh, right around 1999, so I'm back. <laughs> uh, I struggled uh, with intense emotional flooding uh, pretty much as far back as I could remember, which led to really a lot of depression when you turn your anger inward. And... Um, you know, I tried really everything through the years to try to fill that hole. And um, the only problem was I was trying to fill an eternal hole with a bunch of temporary garbage. And um, I always had a very rough time seeing that uh, my emotions or my troubles, circumstances were temporary and seasonal. They felt like they would consume me, which is eventually why I started running more towards uh, quick fixes and things of that nature. Uh, the one thing I did have going for me was baseball. That kept me out of trouble. Uh, big, big, big trouble as a youngster. But um, I tried to fill that emptiness as I got older with, with girls, really. Uh, you know, going out, dating, relationships, things of that nature. Um, and then as time went on, you know, a lot, lot more pride, ego, arrogance, things started rising up inside of me. And um, then I started getting a lot of different tattoos. And really every tattoo that I got was to release pain because I didn't really know another way at that particular point in time to release that pain. I just stuffed it all, buried it all, become numb. And um, it was really, really good at blending in in my environment, being a chameleon, as I like to call it. You know, wearing these different masks. Well, there's one problem. God can't bless who you pretend to be. And um, all of this eventually led into more and more, you know, cutting class, even though I had an opportunity to play in college, but you got to go to class if you want to play. Um, and I really just started turning down a real dark path there. I took on, uh, you know, make, trying to make fast money. I started dealing drugs. Um, just really spiraling out of control, partying all the time, going on trips. Um, my life really, really got to the worst possible place uh, it could ever be. And, um, you know, I, I finally made it to my dream of playing professional baseball. And then within two years, I was playing minor league baseball. And then it switched to playing uh, slow pitch softball in the California Penal League, which was really a terrible, terrible experience. <laughs> but uh, when I got there uh, to jail, um, I was really treated very harshly uh, by a, a sheriff. And 
Um, it's a pretty vulgar, vulgar story, but nonetheless, um, he, he pretty much locked me in a single man cell when I came in. Um, no water, no toilet, and I asked for something to drink and eat. And where should I go to the bathroom? And he told me, go ahead and you know, go on the ground and then drink that. And, um, and I, I was really devastated by that, you know, and, and for the first time in my life, I really, uh, really heard uh, the devil come in and just say, just end your life. And, um, and I contemplated that for a while, but it actually, it broke me for the first time in many, many years, and I started pouring out. I called out for help. Um, I ended up getting to see a doctor, which was, she was a very, very generous, nice person, and gracious person, for sure. And um, the next sheriff that I came across, he, uh, he, he extended grace. It was just like, wow, what is this? He um, just asked me what was going on, how I was doing, what I did. He pointed me in the right direction, said, work a program, get with God. And he reached in and shook my hand, which is something that really doesn't happen there a whole lot. So, um, you know, after that, I, uh, I got housed and I saw a message that said, what are you doing here? Be who you want to be. And like all, the, all the, the lines just started adding up. It was no longer a coincidence anymore. So I, uh, I just prayed to God. I said, you know, if you're really, really, really real, you know, can you just let me see a tree, a sign of life of some kind? And um, sure enough, the next day I was transferred to another facility I had one of the eight rooms with a window. I saw the trees, the block of orange, and the Crystal Cathedral cross. And, um, and it just continued to happen like that. I had signed for two years. I was out in 11 months. No weapon formed against me would prosper. It was just unbelievable. God uh, just completely took care of me in there. He, he showed, he revealed himself to me for the first time. For the first time, uh, I understood what the Holy Spirit was and what He does and how He works. Praise God. Yes. <laughs> um, so basically, just kind of, just to give you a cap of the end of that, uh, obviously it's not totally written yet, but uh, since my release, uh, I've had, you know, wholeness, stability of mind for the first time in my life, peace of past all understanding, uh, break out in laughter, like holy laughter, rolling around, like just unbelievable stuff that, I didn't even know existed. And um, like uh, Pastor Dennis said, uh, I'm working with uh, FCA, which is a baseball ministry. I'm working particularly with 13 and 14 year old boys right at that rough age of kind of, for me, that was pretty tough. So uh, it's just been an incredible blessing. I do a homeless ministry down at Angel Stadium twice a week, all through the homeless trails there to minister and hand out Bibles, pray. And then I'm also uh, involved in Celebrate Recovery, which is uh, just incredible. Well, out of everything, I mean, God has just revealed his love to me, which is just absolutely uh, unconditional and unstoppable. And that's the, uh, just been such a refreshing thing in my life. It, uh, you know, has relabeled me. I now know my identity in Christ. Everything else really is garbage. And I, if you want, if you want to know, I've tried it. I could tell you about it. it it's all garbage. Um, and what just really touches my heart and, and still brings, you know, tears to my eyes and is that God met me in the middle of nowhere when I was not looking for him. And, and this rescue mission was constructed so perfectly tailored to how it would work to me that still blows my pea brain sometimes you know is that he just absolutely 100 percent he does this for us yes and it just amazes me what love is from the father and, and the way i feel i feel like he hit me with a freight train of his love and, and to know that that's what he does for all of us. That's, that's what he's looking to do for all of us. It's just, what a good, good God we have.
And, um, you know, he taught me that my job is not to argue with him, not, not to get in his way, not to get in my own way, because without him, I can mess up a cup of coffee. <laughs> and, um, but just to, to sit back and be loved, which is really hard sometimes for me. Uh, my whole life, I was taught to fight, fight, fight. And uh, even in baseball, you know, you don't give up, you don't give in. And with God, it's the opposite. You surrender. <laughs> you say, here, you know, have all of me. Which is a tough concept. Yes. And we live in a performance-based society. The pressure of the world is pretty strong on that end. But with him, we just relinquish all. And just sit in his love. That is just an incredible concept for me. I got one more thing, and then... Back. Um, last night, God just put this on my heart, and this was a big time verse for me uh, when I was really struggling, when I was lonely, when I was away from home, away from my family. And uh, second, second Corinthians 12, verse 9, says, His grace is all we need. His power works best in weakness. So when I am weak, I'm actually strong because of him. But unless I confess this weakness to him, I cannot receive his strength. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Brian. Powerful witness to God's grace. In a few moments, we're going to sing one of the world's favorite hymns, Amazing Grace. I want to conclude this sermon with a reference to Bill Moyer's documentary film on that hymn, which included a scene filmed in Wembley Stadium in London. Various musical groups, mostly rock bands, had gathered together in celebration of the changes in South Africa. And for some reason, the promoters scheduled an opera singer, Jesse Norman, as the closing act. The film cuts back and forth between scenes of the unruly crowd in the stadium and Jesse Norman being interviewed. For 12 hours, groups like Gun N' Roses had blasted the crowd through banks of speakers riling up fans already high on booze and dope. The crowd yells for more curtain calls, and the rock groups oblige. Meanwhile, Jesse Norman sits in her dressing room discussing Amazing Grace with Moyers. The hymn was written, of course, by John Newton, a coarse, cruel slave trader, he first called out to God in the midst of a storm that nearly threw him overboard. Newton came to see the light only gradually, continuing to ply his trade even after his conversion. He wrote the song, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, while waiting in an African harbor for a new shipment of slaves. Later, though, he renounced his profession, became a minister, joined William Wilberforce in the fight against slavery. John Newton never lost sight of the depths with which he had been lifted. He never lost, lost sight of grace. When he wrote that saved a wretch like me, he meant those words with all his heart. In the film... Jesse Norman tells Bill Moyers that Newton may have borrowed an old tune sung by the slaves themselves, redeeming the song just as he had been redeemed. Finally, the time comes for her to sing. A single circle of light follows Norman, a majestic African-American woman wearing a flowing African dashiki 
as she strolls on stage. No backup band, no musical instruments, just Jesse. The crowd stirs, restless, few recognize the opera diva. A voice yells for more guns and roses. Others take up the cry, the scene is getting ugly. Alone, a cappella. Jesse Norman begins to sing very slowly. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. A remarkable thing happens in Wembley Stadium that night. 70,000 raucous fans fall silent before her aria of grace. By the time Jesse reaches the second verse, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." The soprano has the crowd in her hands. By the time she reaches the third verse, "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Several thousand fans are singing along, digging far back in nearly lost memories for words they heard long ago. When we've been there 10,000 years, as the choir sang that lovely anthem this morning, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Jesse Norman later confessed she had no idea what power descended on Wembley Stadium that night. I think I know. The world thirsts for grace. And as a body of believers, that's our most important gift. To give grace not withhold it. The world falls silent before it. My prayer is that we will be a people who are utterly, thoroughly, radically God-centered, purged of all boasting in ourselves, and aflame with a white-hot love for Jesus Christ who loved us gave himself for us. Friends, it's all about amazing grace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it's hard to fathom the depth, the height, the width of your love. It is so amazing. And I pray, Lord, that as we sing this song together as a congregation, you would speak to us. And if there's anyone in this room who wants to recommit their life to you, who may have wandered a little bit since at one time they knew you well, that they would come forward and we'd be happy to pray with them, my brother Byron and myself and any others who may want to pray. So, Lord, hear these prayers and this request in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.